you want to do 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 not quite what I intended <laughs> yes hello does that work that's good to me brilliant in which case welcome everyone here today to policy exchange we have a fantastic event I think waiting you um, with some brilliant work being done at Policy Exchange that we're going to um, examine today. We have Roger Bootle, who's now, I'm delighted to say, Senior Fellow at, uh, at Policy Exchange. Um, <coughs> and Roger, I'm sure many of you know of his credentials. He's been, um, he is currently, I think, a Senior Independent Director of Capita Economics, but this was a company that you founded, <coughs> uh, I believe. Um, he's uh, an honorary fellow of the Institute of Actuaries as well. He's been Group Chief, Chief Economist at HSBC. And um, if you go back long enough, I first came across Roger when he was one of the seven wise men that Ken Clark put together when he was, when he was Chancellor at, at that time. So a very long pedigree in the economics um, profession. Also, I think, Roger, you have seven books on economics to your name. So brilliant to have you uh, present the first tranche of your work today. Roger at Policy Exchange has been working very closely with James Vitali, who's here today. James, you are Head of Political Economy at Policy Exchange with a particular interest in regulation and, um, and housing, I understand, uh, but clearly a wide breadth as well. Um, you've got your PhD from Cambridge and you joined Policy Exchange, I think, two years ago. So great to have you both uh, on the stage today. I don't think Martin needs much introduction. Martin's probably one of the best-known economic commentators in the world today. Martin Wolf, leading economic commentator at the Financial Times. I'm not quite sure, Martin, how many books you have to your name, but quite a few, as, as well as all the articles that you write on a very... I can't remember myself. Four or five, I think. Four or five. And I think the latest one is called The Crisis of Democratic Capitalism. So an absolutely perfect respondent. Uh, to the work that we're going to hear from uh, from Roger and James uh, today. So, um, welcome everyone, and I'm now going to hand over to Roger, who's going to, I think, set out uh, the framework for today's uh, debate and the work that uh, has been going on. Well, thank you very much, Ruth. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's terrific to see so many of you here today. Uh, now, the work you're going to hear presented this morning is just one bit, the first tranche, I think you call it, of a larger project, a very large project, a policy programme for prosperity, we call it, which is envisaged as a three-year piece of work involving the publication of something like 10 or 12 different studies. This is the first one. Now, why are we doing this? Well, to be perfectly frank, uh, it's born out of a sense of despair, uh, despair at the state of our country. And what are we supposed to do about it? Well, as a humble economist... I thought I couldn't just throw up my hands in despair and say we've just got to you know, like it, lump it and put up with it. I thought the least we could do is to try as economists to say something about what we th thought could actually be done. So that is the spirit behind this work. Uh, now many people who uh, look at this question emphasise macro issues over micro. Uh, and we do in our planned programme of work. Uh, we are going to look at some macro issues, uh, the investment, how we get the rate of investment up in the UK, the role of the tax system, a series of macro issues. But most of what we've got to say is going to be about micro questions, and I hope the reason for that will become clear during the course of our remarks. We're going to be looking at uh, the transport system, which, by the way, I think very nearly robbed us of our chairman uh, this morning, <laughs> the state of the decrepit state of the UK transport system, the NHS, uh, the road system, uh, a whole series of questions, uh, and housing, of course. But we're going to start uh, with the subject of today's <coughs> presentation, which is Economic Transformation Lessons from History, and there are copies of this tomelet at the back. If you haven't already got one, please do take one. I say lessons from history, but um, be aware that this isn't about sort of medieval China. I'm afraid this is all about post-war history. We probably should have shoved the word recent in there somewhere or other. Now, uh, I said born of a state of despair. The first thing I want to say, not that you need, I think, that much reminding of it, is just how poor the state of the UK economy is. This chart shows the growth rate of real GDP per capita and per hour, and these two are our favourite metrics. 
in a series of developed countries from 2007 to 22. 2007 is a key date. Sometimes we use 2008. It's the, the break point is with the global financial crisis, 2007-9. And since then, of course, just about all countries have done a lot worse than they did before. But the UK has done particularly badly. You see that on the left. And if you want to track this through time, here I show the UK against those same countries. Going back to 2007, we are the black line just about at the bottom of the class. And indeed, uh, on the whole, the UK will be shown in black through most of the charts I'm going to show you. And if you want to look at uh, incomes, earnings, average earnings, which after all is what we want to enhance about our country, this shows the growth rate in uh, average real earnings over that period, 2007 to 2022, and unsurprisingly, given that our productivity figures have been so dreadful, so also has been the growth of average earnings. There's been, indeed, hardly any growth of <coughs> average earnings. So that's just by way of intro introduction to tell you what you already knew. That's to say we're in a mess. The growth rate of the British economy is really very, very poor. But there are examples out there, which we're going to come on to discuss in a moment, of countries that have achieved something really radical, that have moved themselves and their economy from a dire state into something quite spectacular. And we've set out to try and learn some lessons from those examples. Now, these are our eight cases, five in Europe and three in Asia. Uh, there are umpteen other cases we could have looked at, and in the case of our further uh, publications that we're going to produce over the next few months and years. We will, I think, look at some other cases. But this is enough to be getting on with, and there's some pretty spectacular examples here. Now, I will come to Mrs. Thatcher's Britain in a moment. Uh, but it's, of course, much less impressive in regard to what was achieved. And she's still a very controversial figure. In fact, what was achieved is still extremely controversial. I'll come to discuss that. But let's look for a moment at what those other countries achieved. This chart shows the average real GDP per capita growth rate over their periods of transformation of the other seven. And just look at those numbers on the vertical axis. You've just seen those pathetic figures for productivity in the UK and indeed real income growth in the UK. These are countries that, at a minimum, have been growing at about 4% per annum, compounded, real, year after year after year. And some of these cases, it's 6 or 7% per annum. Now, you might think, looking at these countries, that's all very well. But you know, look at the countries they've chosen. They're different from the UK. Well, of course they're different. Every country is different. You might even say, well, in their case, economic transformation was inevitable. Let's take Germany and France, for instance, after the war. It was inevitable, you might say, that those countries would uh, transform themselves. Well, I have to tell you, it didn't seem inevitable at the time. That's not what they thought themselves. And by the way, I think this is really the telling point, it's not what happened after the First World War. Very far from it. Both countries were mired in a pretty dreadful position. And after the Second World War, for some reason, and we'll hear a bit about that in a moment, they transformed themselves. And that's largely to do with policy. And what about these other countries? Um, I won't go through every one, but uh, Singapore. Oh, well, we all know Singapore, you know, very successful, inevitable. Gosh, that certainly didn't seem inevitable when Singapore was kicked out of the Malaysian Federation. She had a pretty difficult time. Those of you who know the country will know blessed with no natural resources whatsoever, apart from a very fine harbour. Essentially, what's made Singapore successful is its policies. And Hong Kong's another one. Uh, by no means obvious that Hong Kong was going to be spectacularly successful. South Korea. South Korea was written off as a basket case by the CIA in the early 1960s. And its achievements are all to do with the success of economic policy. I mentioned Hong Kong very briefly. I just want to refer to it. We'll come on to it in more detail in, uh, in a moment. But I just wanted to show you this chart just to emphasize the importance of what we're discussing, what can be achieved as a result of really strong economic growth. This chart shows the growth of real government expenditure per capita, average year-on-year -year growth, starting in 1962 the first block of, uh, of histograms is 62 to 69, and going up to the more recent past. A lot of people say, oh, Hong Kong, oh, that's all very well, but they've only achieved what they've achieved by squeezing the public sector. And there's something in that. There's something in that. But look at the growth rate in real expenditure per capita. 
uh, government expenditure per capita achieved by Hong Kong compared to the UK. That's what happens when you get an economy really growing very fast. Okay, so um, how did we go about this uh, investi investigation? What are we particularly concerned with? Here I give you the sum of, not all of them, but some of the main questions that we were wanting to answer when we were looking at these different countries. And you'll see there's quite a lot of politics involved in this because indeed we do think that politics is right at the center of what can be achieved. A lot of the barriers to economic transformation are in fact political. And the interesting thing, which you'll hear from James about in a moment, about why some of these other countries managed to achieve a lot economically is because somehow or other they overcame the political, political constraints. There was there a pre-envisaged plan? Was it mainly macro or micro that they uh, pursued? Was the transformation due to one key person? How was opposition from losers, because always are losers, overcome? How important were high investment rates? And insofar as they were, how were those financed? Is it important to have high savings? How important was low taxation? How long before success was visible? What was the sequencing adopted? And was this sequencing ideal? And how was political support sustained? So those are some of the key questions that we've borne in, in mind in looking at these countries. Now I want to start by looking at Mrs. Thatcher's Britain. I've already let the cat out of the bag by saying that the transformation, such as it was, uh, was not as spectacular as the others. But I hope to show you that there was something significant achieved over those years. You certainly can't see it if you look at the bare economic stats. Now this chart shows you just the bare growth uh, of GDP, real terms of course, and I've marked in, as we do by the way in all these charts pretty much, the th period of Thatcher's government, we've shaded that in that sort of yellowy fawn block there. <coughs> and the first thing to, no, you know it anyway, but the first thing to note is that on coming to office she presided over an incredibly serious recession. Now, okay, you can say that was the second oil price shock, that has something to do with it, but they were gross errors of policy at this period. This was when the government was obsessed, if you remember, with the growth of the money supply on one particular definition, Sterling M3. The result was it drove up interest rates to 17%. The pound went through the roof. Unemployment soared. The economy tanked. It was simply dreadful. And the apologists say now, of course, that all this was necessary to eventually revive British industry. I don't believe a bit of it. In essence, they made uh, a chronic error of judgment. They didn't understand what they were doing. And it took a monetarist, another monetarist, a Swiss one, to come along a couple of years later and say, oh, you were following the wrong definition of the money supply. And money supply did not come under control, despite 17% interest rates, and yet inflation plummeted. Why? Because of unemployment. Now, Dennis Healy, uh, I was a great fan of his, famously described this monetarism that the government was following as sado-monetarism. I thought that was just about right, I have to say. And he also famously said, there's no inflation in a graveyard. So eventually, success on inflation, but I think not in quite the mechanism through the mechanism that the government envisaged. And it was this um, dreadful period of macro mismanagement which laid waste so much of British industry. Exchange rate absolutely sky high, 17% interest rates, appalling. And if you look at the other side of the chart, you can see that at the end of Mrs. Thatcher's period, the UK is falling into another recession. So book ended with two quite serious recessions. Not a great achievement, you might think. Now that's all going all over the place, that chart. This chart may make the point more clearly. It shows decade averages of economic growth going back to uh, 1920s, would you believe it? And again, the uh, Thatcher period is the sort of fawn shaded bit. When you look at that record of economic growth over the decades, you don't see, do you, any sign of transformation under Thatcher? W what is it? I mean, it's still this gradual decline in growth rates from a peak achieved in the 1960s. And interestingly, the Thatcher growth rate average was worse than the supposedly appallingly dreadful failed 1970s. So no transformation there. Uh, the same is broadly true if you look at it in per capita growth terms. It's the same story. So what's all this business about transformation? What on earth did she achieve? Well, I think you can only see what she achieved if you look at this country in comparison to others, which is what this chart does. UK, France, Germany and the US compared real GDP per capita. 
The first block of histograms is 1950 to 78, and there's the UK, again in black, languishing there at the bottom, pretty much at the bottom of the pack. The next block of histograms is 79 to 90. That's the Thatcher period. And you can see, I say remarkably, the UK is actually top of the pack. The growth of GDP per capita during those years exceeded those three other countries, France, Germany, and US. And then we come to what I think is really the killer point about Thatcher. Thatcherism didn't really die with Mrs. Thatcher's uh, leaving office. It continued. The major government, for all its defects, broadly speaking, carried on with that Thatcher settlement, and so did the subsequent Labour government. And the result is, as you can see, the UK continued outgrowing those other countries, even after Thatcher had left. So I date the period of Thatcherism and Thatcher's success from 2003, not 79, to get over the initial macro disaster, and it's after the second election victory in 83 that a political power base is so strong. I date it from 83 to 2007, the onset of the global financial crisis. So from, from, from my point of view, a lot of Thatcher's success is actually manifest under a Labour government. It's even more striking, this record, actually, if you look at manufacturing. This shows labour productivity in manufacturing. Again, average year-on-year -year growth rate. Uh, first bunch of uh, bars is uh, the 60 to 73, and then the next one, 73 to 79, when the UK does very badly. Then there's this succession of periods, beginning with the Thatcher years, when, again, the UK is outperforming these rivals. So I think there is a, a real achievement there. It's not that we achieve greats of growth unknown in our history, very far from it. But for a first time, for a very long time, the UK was outperforming its leading competitors. And I think that was substantially due to the policies pursued under Mrs Thatcher. Now, how did she do it? What were the policies that really brought about those results? Well, here we come, I think, to a few surprising conclusions. It wasn't really low inflation that did it. Indeed, the inflation rate under Mrs. Thatcher wasn't particularly low. The first thing that happened was, of course, inflation went up, then she brought it down. I talked about that earlier. And by the time she left office, it was on the rise again, quite worryingly, and hence this second recession at the end of her period. Nor was it due, uh, as you might imagine, to lower interest rates. Her period of office coincided actually with a period of very high interest rates, 17% uh, in 1979, uh, briefly uh, 15, possibly even 16% on the day we came out of the RM just after she'd left office, an earlier period when they reached 16%, so very high interest rates. It's only subsequently that we're able to enjoy very low interest rates. A lot of people think that whatever success she achieved was by reducing the size of the state, reducing the share of government spending in GDP. Now, there is something in that. This chart shows uh, the share of government spending in GDP going back to the late 40s. Uh, and you can see during the Thatcher years, the share of government spending did fall a bit, not a lot, and nothing like by as much as the optimists imagined would happen, who supported Mrs Thatcher at the beginning. And by the, by the time she left office, it was rising again. And similarly, as you might imagine, uh, tax revenues as a share of GDP, they initially rose, then came a drop uh, under her policies, which obviously she wanted to achieve much lower taxation. She did achieve lower taxation as a share of GDP, but not by a huge amount, very far from transforming the UK into a low tax economy, and we'll hear about some low tax economies in a moment. What there was, however, and this is, I think, quite significant, was a, a major restructuring of the tax system and a change in marginal tax rates. The top rate of income tax, for instance, went from 83% and 98% indeed on so-called unearned income uh, down to 40%. And, of course, that rate endured under Labour. That was the rate for many years under Labour until Gordon Brown raised it to 50%, not before the 2010 election. So it wasn't really a, it wasn't really a dramatic transformation of Britain into a low-tax economy, though I think those change in marginal tax rates were, um, were relevant. Budget deficit, government borrowing, was there a big reduction? Well, there was a reduction, you can see, indeed moving towards surplus briefly uh, before she left office. But that was a temporary thing, and after not very long, 
uh, the budget was moving again sharply into deficit. And similarly, no major transformation. It's going in the right way. No major transformation with regard to debt. Look at these numbers, by the way. There was a move to very low uh, debt as a share of GDP under Thatcher. That's the most recent low uh, for a very long time at the end of Thatcher's period in office. But the movement, that number, was not really significant during her period in office. And you can't attribute any sort of success, I think, to to that. So I'll come to what I think was the, the root of her success. Um, before I do that, let me say something about what some of the, her opponents would legitimately say. And I'm concentrating on the straight macroeconomics, quite apart from the inequality, the regional disparities, the devastation of northern cities, a whole load of things that people might well complain about. There are, I think, some quite legitimate economic arrows you can shoot at Thatcherism. First of all, I, I would say, and uh, I think Martin might share this, I think she and it boosted the UK's obsession with capital gains on residential housing as being the root of economic success. What I call all of us convincing ourselves that we can get rich by each of us taking in each other's washing. Increased reliance on one sector of the economy, which proved highly vulnerable, that's to say international financial services. Botched privatisations in monopoly public services. That's not to say I'm against privatisation, very far from it. I'll come to that in a moment. But it seemed to me that it probably went into areas it shouldn't have done, and where it did, it was done very badly. And then lastly, you might say um, it stimulated a rampant individualism uh, to the detriment of community and public service. That, I think, would be the case against or a large part of it. A lot of those people who objected to Thatcherism did so, I think, partly because of her personal style, uh, which I recall very well. I'm sure we, we all do. And that style changed the zeitgeist. This is one of the remarkable things about her. I mean, she changed the Labour Party. She changed people's attitude to wealth and success. She was, I think, an absolutely remarkable figure. Now, we're all familiar with the idea at the end of our life we may want to uh, have an instruction that in the event of losing consciousness, we shouldn't be resuscitated. Well, I remember back to the 80s, Mrs. Thatcher, when there was, there was a natural disaster or a major accident, she'd be in the habit of rushing to the hospital and appearing beside the bed of some poor victim. And after the inevitable, you know, don't worry, dear, I'm sure it'll get better, she was in the habit of turning straight to camera there in her resplendent blueness and saying, the emergency services were absolutely wonderful. <laughs> well, in those days, I had a whole load of friends who used to say to me, look, I want one of those bracelets that says, if something really goes badly wrong with me, under no circumstances do I want Mrs. Thatcher to appear at my bedside. <laughs> anyway, let's try and draw that together. There was no plan as such uh, during the Thatcher years, but there was a clear objective and a strategy strategy. Interestingly, the only thing that came close to being a plan is the medium-term financial strategy, which is about government borrowing and the growth of the money supply. But in terms of a detailed plan for how the economy was going to work, there wasn't one. Um, interestingly, something about which the Thatcher government made an awful lot, namely reducing inflation, I don't think had much to do with her subsequent success. Not to say that I think rampant inflation is a good thing, very far from it, not. But she didn't actually reduce it that much, and certainly not sustainably. It was rising towards the end. And something which, by contrast, didn't appear, I think, at all in the 79 <coughs> manifesto and wasn't talked about in the early years, but we had a huge difference, is privatisation. I think that was a major contributor to the success <coughs> of the Thatcher period. Macroeconomic policy, I've said, I think, was largely a disaster. It was a disaster, first of all. There was then a recovery from it. But by the end of the period in office, it was going badly wrong again. It was a series of micro-reforms that made the difference, controlling the power of the unions, stimulating competition, good privatization, the change in marginal tax rates, encouraging foreign direct investment. All these things made a difference. Now, politically, how did she manage it? Because lots of these things were very unpopular. Well, partly down to luck, dare I say it, a chap called General Galtieri. I think he made a huge difference. The Falklands War 
uh, in 82, gave her an enormous push and helped by the fact that the opposition was weak and divided. Uh, after 81, there were signs of economic success which strengthened her position. And a series of practical successes appeared to give her victory in the battle of ideas. And eventually, the opposition parties came to accept her approach to things, and hence the point that they carried on substantially with the same policy agenda. It's difficult to imagine Thatcherism, I think, without Thatcher. This is something that James will come on to talk about in a moment. Uh, however, it's quite wrong to think that the economic achievements of those years were solely down to her. There was a group of people surrounding her who followed the same agenda, had broadly the same ideas, and strikingly in America, of course, the 80s were the period of Reagan and Reaganism. So it felt as though the intellectual climate was with her. She was swimming with the intellectual tide. And so that's my uh, upsum of the Thatcher years. Not wonderful, but if you look at the international comparisons, for the first time in a very long time, Britain actually outperformed her leading competitors, and that was some achievement. Over to you, James. Uh, good morning, everyone. So Roger's taken us through um, the Thatcher case so in a bit of detail, but we looked at seven other case studies that I want to consider here. Just as a reminder on the screen now, this is the questions we asked um, uh, at the outset of our work. Um, and what did we find as it pertained to the other case studies? Well, we found an enormous amount of variation. Let's take these four questions as a, as a group. Firstly, in the, in the case studies we looked at, was there a, a preconceived plan for tran transformation? Well, General Parks, South Korea planned intensively. France did so indicatively and communicated its plans uh, to business via a, a sort of model of economie uh, concerte. Germany sought to move away from a uh, command planned economy uh, and achieve something called Ordnungspolitik, in which the government sets general rules and a framework of expectations. Elsewhere in Asia, Singapore guided its development, whilst Hong Kong had no real plan at all, and consciously so. Uh, Thatcher's government didn't really have a plan, um, apart, as, <coughs> apart from, as Roger said, a, a financial plan to give confidence to the markets. Poland's approach constituted a sort of a plan to move away from planning, as it were, but it nevertheless had quite a, a well-thought-out uh, well idea of what needed to be done and in what order. Uh, was macro reform or micro policy more important? Again, our main finding was one of diversity. Generally speaking, sound macro policy uh, was a necessary precondition for growth, but it was the micro reforms uh, that drove it. But within this broad position, there was a wide um, amount of variety. So in Germany's case, which is on the screen now, currency reform at the very start of the period uh, was determinative. <coughs> Monetary discipline was the sine qua non for restoring incentives to, to save and invest, um, which in turn fueled German growth in the subsequent decades. In the aftermath of the Second World War, the finance minister, Erhard, managed to reduce the money supply to a tenth um, of its previous level whilst maintaining, uh, excuse me, eliminating 90% of price controls, a quite credible um, Achievement. Inflation soared to 25% in 1948, but by 1949, inflation had abated uh, and would re remain low. Similarly, Poland's economic transformation was predicated on a, a macroeconomic stabilisation too. Actually, Leczek um, Balcerowicz, the, the Poland, uh, Polish finance minister, had studied Erhard um, at the University of Marburg before going into government. In January 1990, after the election of the, the non-communist solidarity government, prices were liberalised for the first time, um, and a restrictive monetary policy was introduced to quell the inflation that was uh, released from um, the forced savings uh, coming into the economy. Such measures were, were key to restoring incentives to work and invest. But let's look at South Korea. South Korea's case shows that growth was not predicated at all on, on stable macro, uh, uh, macroeconomic policy. In fact, as this chart shows, inflation was quite turbulent through her transformation period. In the 60s and 70s, um, when per capita incomes were growing at 7% per annum, the inflation rate was close to, to 20%. France, on the face of it, is a great example of a, an economy that was driven by macro reforms, particularly a reshuffle in the labour market away from uh, agriculture and into um, manufacturing, um, but also productivity improvements in sectors um, like retail. Nevertheless, these improvements were driven um, by finance plans, where the government proactively directed credit towards industries that the French government deemed important or strategic for growth in the long run. What about tax? 
Well, in Ireland's case, uh, lower taxation, and particularly lower corporation tax, was central to its strategy for increasing international competitive, uh, competitiveness and attracting multinational companies um, to the jurisdiction. Initially, a reduced rate of 10% um, was introduced specifically for manufacturing companies, um, but this fell foul of EU rules of competition and, and state aid, and so it was replaced by a, a general 12.5% tax rate that applied to company trading profits, which you can see on the chart here. Just two brief points to note on the Irish case. Corporate cut, uh, tax cuts did not harm revenues. In fact, after Ireland um, introduced them, uh, revenues increased. Um, and secondly, the tax take as a percentage of GDP has fallen over time as the economy has grown. Again, in the case of Hong Kong, very low rates of income tax, as low as 10%, um, but now I think at 15% today, were combined with a highly competitive rate of corporation tax, 17%. Corporation tax uh, accounts for about 40% of all of Hong Kong's tax revenues, uh, and tax revenues remain remarkably low by international standards even today as a proportion of the economy. They are around a third of what they are here, uh, and government expenditure too is about half what it is in the UK. The discrepancy that you can see um, between expenditure and tax revenues is accounted for by these non-tax revenues, um, high investment incomes from the investment um, that uh, government-linked funds uh, make. But there are also countries that we studied that managed to achieve economic transformation with comparatively high levels of tax and spend, like France and Germany. In the 1960s, a decade in which France grew at an annualised rate of 5.9% in real terms, both tax revenues and government expenditure rose appreciably. Um, and in the period of the 70s, when growth slows down, actually, um, you also see expenditure and revenue decreasing. And as Roger has meant, uh, mentioned in the, the case of Thatcher's Britain, some countries' um, growth was not predicated or, or, or based on the, the change in the tax burden. It was more rationalisation and, and improvements in the, in the incentives. What about how long uh, until success was visible in these transformation stories? Well, in some cases, growth came extremely quickly. The German and French cases are quite staggering in, in retrospect. French GDP per capita growth averaged 19% per annum in the late 1940s. And as Roger pointed out, as well, whilst much of this was catch-up growth post-war, it was still growing at 4.8% through the 1960s. German per capita GDP growth um, was an annualised rate of 14%, uh, 47 to 49, and a remarkable 8.2% uh, through the 1950s, and this is in real terms. Um, Sim Singapore and Hong Kong similarly experienced near constant improvement. But in other countries... Um, it took lo a lot longer for the reforms to bear fruit. Um, in Poland, which is on the board, short-term pain uh, in the 90s uh, was the price that was paid for far more secure public finances down the line. That paid off in the great, fin uh, great financial crash. Um, uh, in 2008, it was the only country not to go into recession. Um, and also the most economic growth um, by any European country, barring Ireland, since 1990. Um, a slower transformation period was also present in South Korea. The message I kind of wanted to get across at this point here is that we shouldn't really be surprised by this pretty incredible variety across the case studies. I mean, all of the countries we've looked at are different. They're different sizes, they're different maturities, some of them have different political operating systems, and the, the temporal contexts are different too. Um, it's the, 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 the situation in the, in the 40s in Europe is very different to the one we, we see today, for example. Um, so looking for an ideal economic blueprint that could be copied and pasted into any economy, one that prescribes you know, an ideal rate of income tax or an, in, an ideal rate of corporation tax or an ideal sectoral distribution is probably a fool's errand. Nevertheless, what we were able to extrapolate from our case studies were some consistencies to do with how economic transformation was delivered politically. And I just want to focus on this for a little bit uh, and these four questions in particular. Was transformation due to one key person? Or, to put it differently, how important was political leadership? Well, the answer is very important. Um, in each of the case studies, we found that a single figure was frequently responsible for driving economic foundation, uh, transformation. Thatcher in the UK, Erhard in Germany, Jean Monnet in France, um, Barcelorowicz in Poland, Copperthwaite in Hong Kong, Lee Kuan Yew in, in Singapore, and uh, General Park Chung Hee in South Korea. The only exception really is Ireland, which had more of a sort of single important agency, the Industrial Development Agency, that, that sort of drove change through. Um, it's truly difficult to imagine that any of the case studies we looked at would have achieved their, their transformation without their leader, you know, Britain without Thatcher, um, Poland with Basel, without Balsarowicz, 
um, or you know, Singapore's adoption of a, a highly successful model of strong state capitalism without Lee Kuan Yew. In many ways, I think this is quite a reassuring trend because it confirms another of the hunches that Roger and I had at the outset of the project, which is that individuals really, really matter and their decisions at particular moments have a decisive uh, bearing on outcomes, which I think is a bit of a, an anodyne to some of the pessimism that we, we've, we've been hearing about the UK economy. It would obviously be ludicrous to believe that the stock of talented people with strong convictions and a strong political skill set is lower today than it was in the periods which we, we studied. I think more to the point is that we're simply not getting those talented people into positions of authority where they can instigate, uh, instigate that change. Singapore, I think, is a case in point. It spends vastly more time thinking about how to get the most talented Singaporeans into positions of authority. Yes, it's about money. Um, uh, public sector remuneration is, is, is linked and indexed to, to private sector pay. But it's much broader than that. And, and the more important things, I think, are to do with the political cu culture of, of Singapore. Meritocracy is, is deeply embedded in, in Singaporean society. Uh, so is public service. And the Singaporean Public Service Commission uh, invests millions in scholarships to identify talented people early in their education system and get them into senior government positions. It's just worth noting here that none of these remarkable individuals achieved what they achieved on their own, and they were usually surrounded by highly skilled and capable teams. In Singapore's case, um, Lee built this powerful political force in the, in the People's Action Party, and he did it before he went into government, and it included people like Gong Ki Sui, uh, his finance minister, and they agreed on some fundamentals about what needed to be changed. Um, Thatcher had an array of, of Thatcher rights who did just as much to give substance to that, to that creed uh, as she did. Individuals like Nigel Lawson and, and Geoffrey Howe and David, now Lord Howe, is, who's with us um, this morning. On other occasions, uh, in the case with Jean Monnet, th these teams were maybe officials and civil servants, not necessarily politicians. But in all cases, there was a strong affinity between the political and the bureaucratic arms of government on the ends to be achieved. Was there a sequencing to reforms? Was it ideal? How was opposition overcome? I'll come to the diagram in just a moment. Um, for would-be transformers, um, success was almost entirely dependent on picking battles um, wisely, um, because even if you have broad support for a reform agenda, you will almost inevitably create winners and losers in, in your policy making. Um, and we can think of um, specific sectoral examples, I'm sure, about the UK today. Being clear-sighted about those battles, when to have them, which ones to take on early, and which to put off, perhaps, is absolutely key. Um, in the Polish case, shock therapy and macroeconomic stabilisation was considered the precondition uh, for economic transformation. Nothing good could, had, could happen until they'd done that. So it was addressed first when the government felt it had the most political capital to absorb any popular backlash to, for example, the higher interest rates. Um, pension reform was delayed for two decades. It actually took until Donald Tusk, um, 20, 25 years later, to, to start gripping it. Um, and the government put, put um, other public sector issues like education and healthcare uh, first. Though not strictly in the main period we studied with Germany, the Hartz labour market reforms in, uh, were quite deliberately targeting um, the issue of unemployment first because they knew they lacked um, uh, strong union representation that might object to really important reforms that would be painful. Um, uh, and they, they didn't try to tackle the, the issue of collective bargaining directly. Um, this chart on, on, uh, on the screen, I don't know if anyone is familiar with it. Uh, does anyone know where it comes from? Correct. Um, so uh, our friends at CPS are not nearly as good at presenting data um, as our Ben Sweetman, and this is quite difficult to read. But um, I do think it makes the point that in the 70s, there was some clear sighted thinking about how all these problems were interconnected um, and how knock-on effects would, 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 would occur. Um, there is another chart, I didn't get into this slide, which showed that in their view, tackling the power of trade unions was absolutely critical. Uh, it had to be done first. Um, Additionally, in almost all cases of transfer moment, some moment of crisis um, was leveraged or utilised in the, in the cause of reform. National traumas sort of create this moment of flux, which is conducive to change. Um, and the best leaders kind of capitalise on that to, to, to create a sense of mission, a sense of purpose. Sustaining political support. Most of the countries in question um, had a strategy for ensuring that um, a supportive coalition was maintained for transformation. Transformation is not a two- or three- or four-year project, and it definitely isn't the case in, in the UK. Thatcher was in power for 11 years, um, and even that pales into comparison to some of the time that our Asian leaders had. Um, so sustaining political support and consent for an agenda over time is essential. 
Clearly, democracies have greater constraints here, and perhaps Martin might touch on that in a moment. Those that wield power in democracies have to go to the ballot box more regularly, um, uh, if at all, for, for non-democracies. Uh, and this can create a sort of short-termism that, that militates against transformation. But I don't think we should underestimate the power that a leader with a democratic mandate has to change things. Um, and we've seen that with the democracies that we studied. It, also, it is also not the case that autocracies or authoritarian regimes don't need to worry about public opinion. Performance legitimacy is critical to some of the case studies we looked at. The continuity of leadership in Singapore, for example, is down to the fact that there's a, a national consensus that growth is the main responsibility of government, um, and the fact that um, the People's Action Party has delivered growth year on year on year. Um, some of the strategies that we looked in the paper for retaining public support included um, well-targeted broad tax cuts um, and efforts to widen share ownership in, in Poland and uh, the UK, but I mean, as broadly, we're agnostic about that. It's just the case that you need to have something that gives a sense that growth is a project um, which will benefit all. So I've dealt here with what I think are the sort of key political lesson, lessons about political growth. Um, and for my part, I just wanted to finish on two questions that we posed about investment um, and how to fund it, because I think they probably offer the most emphatic lessons about economic policy that we could draw. In every case study we looked at, growth was at least in part driven by an, uh, an increase in the investment rate. Um, so we have here on the, on, on the screen the persistently higher rates of French investment and then uh, the gulf between Britain and some of the Asian economies that we studied. South Korea's experience here is particularly notable. It started out with a remarkably low investment rate, but today has one of the highest in the world. This, again, probably isn't surprising. I think we all agree that uh, increasing investment drives productivity, adds to the capital, the, the plant machinery that's, that's wrapped around workers in, in countries. So I think the more interesting question to pose at this stage is how did countries pay for that increased investment? How did they fund it? And I think, I think here our analysis um, yields some quite interesting findings. Almost every single country that we studied facilitated that increased investment through high levels of domestic savings. Now, I've chosen two case studies, Germany and Singapore, just to illustrate the point. But they do represent the rule for our studies and not the exceptions. Germany's post-war economic growth is often associated with Marshall aid grants. Um, but there's good reason to think that actually this wasn't the decisive picture in the German story. Far more important was the effort to stimulate savings, first by stabilising the currency, securing positive real interest rates for savers, and then by cutting income tax and creating tax deductions for savers. Uh, for savers. Income tax was slashed by about 50% in the late 1940s, and deductions were introduced for things like investments um, with cooperative societies. And these were added to high deprecation um, allowances for, uh, depreciation allowances for companies. In the case of Singapore, savings were central to their plans for economic transformation too. The Central Provident Fund, which is a compulsory retirement savings scheme, was established by the post-war colonial government uh, and contribution, uh, contribution rates were and remain very high. And this is combined with high level of government and business savings too. High savings and high growth drove the current account surplus in Singapore. After the investment rate peaked in the 1980s, Singapore began to export considerable sums of capital abroad. Um, those surpluses amounted to something like 30% of GDP in 2005. Uh, and the government is uh, estimated to hold assets of a value around 100% of GDP too, but that's not public knowledge. Um, that has meant low debt interest over time, low borrowing, returns on investment, and that has translated into a far rosier fiscal picture for the country. The exception to this trend, of course, that I've set out is Ireland, which funded most of its increased investment from abroad, and the UK, as we saw on, on Roger's charts. British saving rates are weak compared not simply to the high-growth Asian economies uh, like Singapore, uh, but also similar-sized European economies too, as you can see on this chart. And persistent low savings have meant that we've tended to fund our investment through overseas borrowing. And this is evident in the current account position. There might not be uh, an a priori way, uh, a best a priori way to uh, fund investment, but it certainly is the case that those economies with higher rates of savings are more, uh, more robust uh, and more resilient than those without. The trade-offs required to deliver high rates of savings, of course, are not an easy political sell, and we need to be far more frank with the public about what that would entail. Reduce non-investment public expenditure or reduce consumption. And I think at that stage, it's probably best to hand back to Roger um, with this slide. Well, thank you, James. I'm going to be very brief and talk just briefly about the lessons which you'll find laid out in 
uh, the tomelet that I hope you have. Um, I won't go through all of them in great detail. Some of them may appear a bit trite, but then much of the truth is trite. Uh, I think where there are marked variations on tax, for instance, it's interesting. There are some countries where low tax has been absolutely at the centre of what they've had to offer. Uh, Hong Kong and Singapore being key examples, and Ireland, another one. And there are other countries, France and Germany, that certainly weren't majoring on low tax or low government spending as a share of GDP. What I would say about this is that if you are not going to offer something else big, then it'd be a good idea not to be running with a high rate of taxation, uh, which is one of the characteristics, I would say, of current-day Britain. Um, let me just concentrate at the end of all this, because I want to hear from Martin and then from all of you. As you've heard, a lot of what we've had to say has been about the politics. I think this really is a major challenge. Supposing you identify what you really want to do. I mean, for instance, raising the investment rate, and James says, in order to fund that, raising the savings rate. How do you politically get that through to the uh, electorate? A major problem. And in the last uh, lesson, I um, said something that I think is absolutely critical in this regard. That's to say, you need a combination, I think, of a vision and early successes. Early successes without the vision won't be enough. People have got to understand where this thing's going. But simply having a vision without delivering early successes, I don't think is going to work either. And in the cases that James has talked about, I think you have had with one or two minor exceptions, both those things, a clear understanding of where the economy is going, and then a series of successes which help to build support and confidence for the government. That's what I think needs to be done. Now, James talked a bit about leadership. This is lesson nine. Leadership is crucial, um, but it's more than the contribution of one key individual. I think the order in which things need to go is as follows. When we develop the rest of our... Um, investigation over the next three years, two and a bit years, I think we're going to be driving towards this sort of conclusion. First comes the agenda. We must sort out what we have to do. After the agenda, there then needs to be uh, a coalescence of people around and in support of that agenda. And it's my view that out of that group of people will come a leader. Thanks very much, and I'm fascinated to hear what Martin has to say. Thank you, Rogers. Thanks, James, Martin. Some quick reflections. Go the safe way. Okay. Hmm. Well, first of all, it's a great pleasure to be here with you. Um, uh, I don't know what you mean by quick, given the length of the introductions. Um, <laughs> but they merit some consideration. So I'll be as quick as I possibly can. Probably not as quick as you would like, but fairly quick, not more than 15 minutes anyway. Um, so first of all, I think the project that is being embarked upon here is very important um, uh, f for two reasons. The first is, uh, I've written a great deal about this, clearly for all of us, Britain's economic performance since the financial crisis has been a great disappointment. And, the, and it um, matters not just for international comparisons, but actually, I think, for the welfare of the British people and the stability of the political system. So this is not a small issue. Indeed, I think it is the central issue. I think it is also true, perhaps this is a third, that... Um, British politics at the moment needs a great deal in help in finding an answer. Uh, I think it will be reasonable to say that neither the government nor the opposition provides anything very credible as an answer to these challenges, not least because though they agree that things are going not too well, they actually amazingly agree on not doing anything significant about it. <laughs> Uh, so I think we are a, as close to a complete failure of politics to rise to the occasion as you could imagine. And for, for me, in my writing about democracy, that's very frightening. And the third reason that I think this is a very important project is it does something that most countries do too rarely, and Britain almost never, which is actually system, try systematically to learn from others' experiences and the others don't actually include the US, which I think is a pretty bad model for Britain. 
because believe it or not, we are not the US. We are far more like France. It just happens to be true, or Germany, on a good day. Um, so, so um, some of the greatest work in economics, which had enormous impact on the world and on me, uh, was done in a comparative studies. I think of little Skotowski Scott, the great project in the late 60s and early 70s, and the work done by Bagwati and Kruger on openness and development. So this is, a, this is following a very important um, predecessor, predecessors. I'm going to make three broad points. One, I'm going to talk about the Thatcher transformation, or in my view, complete non-transformation. Second, uh, the broad lessons to be learned from the analysis. And third, some lessons for the UK and issues that need to be discussed in taking this program forward. Now, let me be very clear on the first point. I won't be able to go into it in great detail. I was an enthusiastic supporter of the Thatcher program. Most of it was written, happened before I was uh, at the EU, at the EU, at the FT. But uh, uh, I believed it could and would be transformative. And now, 40 years later, I have to say that I am deeply disappointed with the results. Now, this is not just because, um, as they point out, growth actually slowed after it, which isn't great. Um, but that when you look at what really did transform was that the countries we like to compare ourselves with started doing much worse. That's not a transformation by us. <laughs> it's a transformation by them. <laughs> Why did that happen? I think there are, are several reasons. They got very complacent, that's for sure, because their previous 20 years have been so dramatically successful. Secondly, a very large part of the catch-up opportunity they had ha was exploited because they become much richer than us. France even was significantly richer. Um, uh, and, uh, and third, they had taken advantage specifically of the EU integration trade opportunity, which we actually, not discussed in their paper, were exploiting in the 80s and 90s. That, we joined in 73, that was, it took quite a while to go through the transition to openness, and I know it's politically unacceptable and it was shown in the paper, but as Nick Kraft said, it helped us to be part of the EU. I'll come to this in a second. And I would say it is particularly disappointing that we did so badly because we had this colossal oil and gas windfall, which, to put it bluntly, we obviously wasted. And I will leave aside the complete mess of macroeconomic policy, which was simply appalling. Um, now, it was appalling in the 70s too, so it's an all-party appalling mess, but it, what they were appalling. And in the end, we had a period of modestly good growth, I agree with this, which blew up sensationally after 2007. We've never revived. And my view is if we did the accounting properly, we would conclude that our real, true underlying growth before 2007 was slower than it was and, and makes the slowdown look not so bad because so much of it was related to a colossal global financial boom of which we happen to be a particular beneficiary because London. And so, and it's filtered out into the British economy in many ways and then blew up. I think a realistic analysis has to conclude that this transformation did not work as I thought it was. And I could discuss a lot more on that. So that's, I'm sure, already mean that I'm going to be thrown out of the room. Now let me get to the lessons from the analysis, which are important, because they are really important lessons here, and I think useful ones, and I think I can point to a couple of points which might be helpful in further thinking. The first and most general point I would make, which is not addressed directly in this report <laughs> at all, but I think must be in future reports, is a point that has become increasingly real to me, and it's sort of what Alexander Hamilton would tell us. And Alexander Hamilton was a seriously, seriously affected policymaker. 
in economic policy making, the most important in the last 250 years, in my view. Well, he did create modern America. Now, um, all economies have to learn how to do new things. That's what development is about. The successful lessons are of countries that have done this. They've done it in a number of different ways, but basically they knew that they were doing this and how to do this. I think we've been very bad at thinking about this because we've been world we were world leading for so long and it sort of happened by accident. We need a systematic policy of learning how to do new things. I'll come to that in a second. Second, I agree completely, opening, export competitiveness, func market functioning are necessary conditions for success. They're essential. On their own, they're not quite <coughs> sufficient. One of the key roles of the EU which was important in five of these cases, I would argue. Germany, France, moving on from the OEC and the Marshall Plan into European integration. The UK in the 80s and 90s, Ireland and Poland. They were all anchored by the EU. It anchored their openness and made them credibly open, and it encouraged investment, both domestic and international, as a result. Um, by the way, ASEAN has been very important for Singapore. Um, the, um, uh, and you've already discussed this, I won't go into more detail. Authoritarianism has really helped, particularly with really decisive changes in policy. It's obvious for Hong Kong, Singapore and South Korea. But I think the fact that Germany was essentially under Allied control really helped to do what Erhard did. If it hadn't been for that, it probably wouldn't have happened. Uh, I think we have to recognize these political conditions. Now, here I'm going to get to what seemed to me two absolutely fundamental distinctions which weren't made but lie behind this analysis and will have to be used if we think about our future. The first distinction is between very far behind economies which have enormous catch-up opportunities. They have the catch-up opportunities because they're just what used to be called, we're not allowed to use that term anymore, backwardness. And the, versus economies that are much closer to the frontier. They generally, where they are operating, they do so pretty close, pretty close to the most advanced economies. The most advanced economy in productivity in almost every sector for the last 120 years has, of course, been the US. Um, the second crucial distinction is what I, between small platform economies and larger countries that need a vigorous domestic economic base. A platform economy, Singapore is a platform economy, Ireland is a platform economy. It's a country which is extremely open, offers good infrastructure and excellent workers, and builds its development ultimately on massive inflows of foreign direct investment. And it's small enough to develop on that basis alone. We are not and never can be a platform economy. Never, actually, by the end of this century, with China and India and the US reaching the potential scale, perhaps we could, but we can't now. And that's really important. So Singapore and Thames was beyond belief cretinous, quite apart from the fact I love, I wrote a column on this, I'd love to see the policies that will get our savings rate to 50% of GDP, which means lowering consumption by about 30 five percentage points of GDP, good luck with that. Um, South Korea was interesting, it was a non-platform economy like Japan, but it was a dramatic catch-up opportunity. It was way behind the rest of the world, and Poland was a bit of both, bit platform, bit catch-up economy. Um, we are really much more like Germany and France throughout this story, and we have to think like that. They have big problems now too, by the way, not quite as big as ours. Um, but I think we have to say 
Look at all these countries. What are we like? And what do we learn from the position we have? And there are some countries we can learn from more than others because they're more like us, which is not to say we don't learn anything from Ireland or Singapore, but there are some countries we have to learn for. And if we look at our close neighbors, it is pretty clear they have similar problems. Um, finally, lessons for the UK in my last couple of minutes. As I said, it's a near frontier, non-platform economy and it has a reasonably functioning market economy, except in some crucial areas we all know about, such as land use, planning, uh, planning and building infrastructure. We don't fix that, we don't hope. I think the UK's competitive, internationally competitive productive base is too narrow, and that's a really important problem for the future. Um, we clearly need to raise savings and, um, and investment by several percentage points of GDP, and there is no way that can be done without somebody's consumption being reduced. And there are going to be people in the middle and upper, upper of the income distribution, and these are huge political cha challenges. I know that the authors and probably most people here would love to have a low tax economy, but in my view, as Steve's pointed out, that can only be done with agreeing on where we're going to cut spending, and there is no chance whatsoever of radical changes in um, spending by a British government. Nobody is prepared to talk about and do about it, so we're going to have to avoid that. We have, I think, the wrong financial markets, we, our financial markets should be more like those of the US. They are not, and we have been very bad at changing them. Uh, on a good day, I tend to think that the domestically facing financial markets in the city are completely ossified and should be blown up. <laughs> on a bad day, I'm even more depressed about them. Uh, look, my son is an entrepreneur, has created a new business, which is really quite dynamic. Um, uh, in the tech space, and not a single one of his investors are British. And that's a pervasive and general phenomenon. Thank God the Americans are more helpful. Um, and my final point, we need to, a policy, and this is the most controversial thing, which will internalize the very deep externalities associated with the creation of completely new industries. We are semi-catch-up. And this will involve strategic industrial policy, as Alexander Hamilton would tell you. Nobody wants to think about it because every industrial policy we have adopted has failed. So we better learn from all those failures and decide what a sensible policy will be. It will not be about picking winners as firms, but it will be to, to, to trying to back some sectors that have reasonable hope of generating a future dynamism in this country, and I think there are a few that we can envisage. And finally, though they, the authors don't want to discuss it in the t at all, in the longer term future, not having the EU as an anchor for openness and as a potential market for large scale investors in this country, domestic and foreign, will be a problem. So we will have to raise our game even more than we have done in the last 14 years to offset this. And the future will otherwise, if we don't do these things successfully, be pretty bleak. Thank you very much. have such a punchy debate already uh, started. Unfortunately, we have used quite a lot of time. I'm obviously going to let this run a little bit to take some questions because we have 250 people, I'm told, registered online as well as uh, people in the room. So I'm going to ask you, first of all, if you, uh, if you ask a question, to introduce yourself very briefly, keep your comment or question extremely short, and then I will try and take a few at a time to get as many people in as possible. Yes. <coughs> Oh, there's a mic. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, Jeffrey Owen. One important thing about transformations is how long they last, whether the transformative impact 
last uh, in the subsequent decades. Now, um, I think most people would agree that in some areas, the Thatcher period had a transformative effect, and Roger showed those ch um, charts on productivity, which, where we caught up with uh, our um, nearest neighbours. Now we're at the bottom of the class. We're in a terrible state. Uh, when you read the papers, we're going, going to the dogs, productivity hopeless, and so on. My question is, is that reversal due to mistakes made in the 20 years since Mrs. Thatcher left office, or should we blame it all on Mrs. Thatcher? Right, okay, any other comments? Yes, if I could take this gentleman here as well. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Dominic Fien. I work for Hill and Knowlton Strategies, and we counsel a lot of global corporations on geopolitical issues. So I have a question around the, I agree with Martin around the importance of the openness driven by the EU, but I, my question is around a kind of a wider paradigm shift that we see. We see the US being a lot more protectionist. We see the EU talking a lot more about, you know, not global free trade, but you know the importance of self-sufficiency within the union. Does that not somewhat change the frame of reference that we need to be thinking about? Perfect. Okay. In which case, we've got the first two. Roger, if I could ask you to kick off, maybe on Jeffrey's uh, question. Mm. Perhaps change the last second. I don't know. Um, well. Awesome. Yes, it's. I, I don't think I actually know the answer. I'm sorry to say, it's a, it's a fine question. Um, there are, have been a series of mistakes since the end of Thatcher, or I would say the end of the Th Thatcher period of policies, which I take all the way up to 2007. There have been a series of mistakes, um, including uh, what's happened. I would say to tax rates and the overall level of government spending. More recently, of course, we've had. Um, uh, a, a surge in worklessness. To some extent, though, I think there, there, there was a gap in what Thatcher achieved, and it goes to what Martin was talking about in saying that we have a narrow, too narrow a base of internationally competitive mm -hmm. industries in this country. It isn't only financial services, I mean, a um, yeah, massive sure. amount of business services, I mean, uh, in which the city is either number one or two in almost all these business services. But if you go outside business services, and financial services, and I guess pharmaceuticals, more recently, stuff, some stuff to do with tech and AI, which is still too small. She never achieved, I think, enough of a base of um, competitive British activities. I think that was always a, a, a fault in what she achieved. But hey, you know, to do what she did in what was quite a short period of time, I still think is actually pretty. Uh, impressive. Martin very amusingly said it isn't that we transformed ourselves, it was that they transformed us <laughs> themselves in a bad way. Uh, and there's something in it. But actually what was going on there was a gradual <coughs> slowdown in growth for everybody in the face of a whole series of not very uh, favourable world factors. And we happened to have actually coped with that relatively well, which we wouldn't have done and indeed didn't do before. So I think there is nevertheless something genuine there. A very quick point. Um, on the Jeff's question, which is obviously fundamental, um, so I, I will continue to be provocative. Um, I think too much of the increase in productivity we got during and in the post-Thatcher period when the labor reform, market reforms were really working, took the form of getting rid of um, workforces where there was clearly overemployed workforce and getting rid of lousy firms, both of which were a good thing, yep. right? But sustainable productivity growth, once you've done that, comes from having fast-growing, dynamic, innovative frontier firms for a country like ours. Um, very difficult to do in in some areas like business services, but maybe AI, AI will change that. But, uh, but the the point is, I don't think we created enough of those firms. The new the new did not replace the old on the scale I hoped for. I think we need to discuss why that didn't happen, but it didn't happen, and that makes sustaining productivity growth 
in the longer term more difficult. So I think it was related to a very big omission in the way we were thinking about it. I've got a lot more to say, but I won't. Say. On the global economy, I think the point is very good. For Britain, which is unavoidably a medium-sized open economy now outside the EU, it's quite clear that the global economic environment looks now considerably more adverse than we assumed in 2016, if you go back to the discussion at that time. And it doesn't look likely that it's going to change for the better. And I'm putting it very gently. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if you're online, please do um, make yourself <laughs> known. Um, we have time for another couple of questions. If, if there's anyone who wants to ask one, we have one from the lady here, and then I'll take Jonathan Norton from Urban Futures, who's online after that, Jonathan. Uh, my name's Caitlin Kelly. I work for Quorum, the children's charity, but a long time ago I did some work for the Singapore government, which was interested in creating, making Sin Singapore into a renaissance city. And they came to London and also Paris and Barcelona and Berlin and learnt from the policies and, and practices in those cities. And I was struck by... Um, your description of uh, Singapore as a platform economy. And I did wonder whether is one of the challenges that London is perhaps also a platform economy yeah. and, you know, that there's, there's a sort of, mis not a mismatch, but something happening that makes it challenging for the UK government to set policy, given that that reality is there. Thanks, Caitlin. And Jonathan? Jonathan, are you there? Hello, can you hear me? Just about. Um, I, I was fascinated by the uh, mention of political will um, throughout, because I wasted, I think, my entire career trying to generate political will on the land use planning and infrastructure front. Mm -hmm. um, would the panel think that if political will could be demonstrated in this area, which obviously hasn't been shown since the 60s, that it might generate the political will more broadly? Brilliant. That's all, thanks. Okay, well, I'm going to um, start this time with James, who I think is particularly interested in some of these issues. Yeah, ju just to, just to absorb this point, I completely agree. I, I've tried to conceptualise sort of housing planning more of a as, as more of a political problem than a policy problem. I mean, it, there is no shortage of clever policies um, about how we might boost housing supply. Um, that's not the problem. The problem is, are we dealing with the the, the conflicts of interest? Are we getting over those political barriers effectively? Um, so I quite agree. The, the one thing I'd say about political will is in almost all the case studies that we studied, that political will and that conception of what needs to be done with political power was developed before they got into power. Um, the amount of time that leaders have to reflect on how to get through these nitty problems once they're in positions of authority is extremely limited. Um, so a lot, of that, a lot of that thinking, I think, needs to be done before, before um, parties get into power. Um, which is why it's kind of concerning that we probably don't know what the, the Labour position on, on all these things is yet. We do know that they really want to change the planning system. Quite. So, uh, so that's one, one definite. Martin wanted to comment. Just two comments. Uh, London would be a great city-state economy, and I wrote that in a <laughs> column about 20 years ago. Uh, it should secede. Uh, it's the most plausible secession candidate by far in Britain, and it almost certainly will be immensely beneficial to the rest of the UK, though it doesn't realise it. Uh, uh, because then they would, no, I'm being, I'm being a bit aggressive, b aggressive, but they would be like South Korea, they would have to reinvent themselves. Um, but obviously, looking at uh, the competitive advantage of Britain, uh, of Britain uh, an immense amount of this, not all of course, but an immense amount is anchored in London and its immediate hinterland and it's, a, it's the richest area and most productive area in Europe, one of the most uh, productive areas in the world, anchored in uh, sectors which, as Roger says, uh, uh, are very, very important with the right language and all the rest of it. So that's, uh, that's a possible future. On political will, um, one of the things that strikes me is that there are two sorts of things that animated uh, transformations. One, real fear. Yeah. I mean, they, people crisis, feel, yeah. I won't go into all these stories, but I, I've visited all these places and I've worked on South Korea in the 70s. This was terror. Uh, mm -hmm. doesn't and the, je the perception of a really big opportunity, which they could see. The leaders could see, they, 
Hong Kong is a bit different. The sui generis upwards still a colony throughout this. Well, you didn't need political will. You had the empire. But the uh, but generally, uh, so my feeling to the extent you believe Thatcher was a transformation and there were clearly changes, it was also because of a sense, which I rem we all remember here, I suspect, that things in the 70s were going terribly badly and had to be changed. That was clearly there. So in that sense, there was a fear of that. One of the things that surprises me most about British politics, and this is cross-party, is given the last 14 years, which have hardly been a tremendous success, is the extraordinary lack of ambition in our political system. And that, I think, is frightening. Much more frightening the objective situation we're in, because I would have expected more. I don't want to end on a note of despair, so um, maybe you could think of a more optimistic question to ask <laughs> while I turn to James. Yeah, just on that, I think that one cause for optimism, um, maybe useful right now, is that I think increasingly, just on that point of the sense of terror, but maybe a sense of um, uh, necessity, um, it is increasing the case that governments and parties uh, agree on, on growth and that growth is the metric by which they will be judged. So I think, you know, one of the things we examined in this paper is is there an pr inherent problem in democracies in that there's change of parties? These things will always be political footballs. Um, well, if both parties are being judged on, on the metric of economic growth and a party can demonstrate that a, a policy is delivering growth, it's much more likely it's going to be um, carried on by whatever party. Roger? Uh, just a, a few words about Singapore, uh, following on from the question, which I'm a great admirer. Mm -hmm. And um, Martin made reference to this idea of Singapore on Thames, which really was always bonkers in the way that it was conceived, because so many people uh, who espoused this vision had never been there and didn't understand what Singapore was all about. They thought it was a you know, free market paragon. Well, in some ways it is. In other ways, it's completely the opposite. Mm. And although it's very, very interesting, because it, although it has a very low uh, level of government spending in GDP and low rates of tax, it's a very strong government and a very interventionist government. Mm. And so much of what's been achieved in Singapore is, as a result, of government action and government policy. That's one very interesting thing about it. I think we could probably learn from that. It's not all about just splurging large amounts of money. And that goes back to the vision of the government, uh, not just Lee Kuan Yew, but a group of people um, around him. The other interesting thing I, I think about Singapore, and James referred to this earlier, is the way they pay their politicians and senior civil servants. Now, I happen to think that one of the problems uh, that we face in this country, and it partly explains as uh, Martin said, and I quite agree with him, the absence of panic about the British uh, position is that, in my view, we have, on average, a very poor quality of political leader, or indeed follower. Um, and we have, I think, um, to use an old Labour phrase, we have a civil service that's not fit for purpose. Now, there are all sorts of things that need to be done about this, but I think we need to pay our politicians and our civil servants differently it's very interesting to me that um, in, in Singapore they're not just raising the pay, but they're actively seeking out and stimulating, um, uh, recruiting really, really able people imbued with the sense of public service, but actively rewarded as well. Uh, I think that, that's also very, very true in Hong Kong, by the way. Mm -hmm. A large part of its success, we've got the Hong Kong expert here, Neil Monnery, but it's having really, really good civil servants. Excellent. Thanks, uh, that's Roger. Lord Kinnock, if I may. Thanks very much. Uh, Martin it must be right that uh, fear is the great spur, but of course it has to last. If it is true, well, I recommend Martin's most recent book, because that will frighten the pants off you. <laughs> uh, and in terms of opportunity that fear makes countries, systems, regimes search for, is the great opportunity, the fear that we must feel uh, in circumstances of rapid climate change and is the opportunity that comes out of it, the transformation, which is now not just an aspiration, but a basic condition of sustainable life. Thank you very much. I'm going to take a final two um, questions, if I may. Uh, yes, at the front, please. Hi, hi there. Uh, I'm James Fierro. I'm with Eco Capacity Exchange. Uh, we've been uh, trying to tackle the systemic problem globally of 
the monetary system, uh, which has been a fascinating project for two and a half decades. Um, I uh, have been deeply engaging with government uh, leaders around the world on this topic and uh, have observed uh, we were invited uh, and sponsored by the UK government and, and engaged quite deeply with uh, the City of London. And they, um, you know, have you know, put forward their great proposition that they've been a leading financial center for 800 years, um, which is probably very true, except they have lost ground. The financial bet that has been made in, in the UK of being a leading financial center and that being a key driver of the economy <clears throat> is changing dramatically today because the world of innovation that has come into the financial economy is dramatic. And I'm not even talking about cryptos and all this Bitcoin, but, but the whole, they've spawned an evolution and, and, and the, the policies being put in place by other countries right now and the, and the pace at which innovation is happening, uh, it strikes me that, that the UK is at deep risk, and London City is at deep risk of being disintermediated. Um, and now you face the problem of also many of these other countries, they have um, you know, regimes that are not democratically elected. And here we have a problem of governments changing multiple times, uh, in, 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 and therefore I see two-pronged challenge for, for the UK. One, how do you address uh, the losing ground on the important pillar of financial services. Number two, how do you ever get the political capability uh, that can do what Martin commented about is to uh, ensure learning new things? Thank, thank you very much. And finally, if I may turn to online, to Tim Hubbard of King's College London. Over to you, Tim. Um, what's that? Unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so I mean, it's kind of partly following on from the previous thing about environment. Kennedy um, had the idea of a mission for the US, which was depressed about the state of play with Soviet dominance of space. And that invig invigorated the American economy. Such a huge amount of money and investment went into the space race. Isn't there something opportunity like that in the climate change space? We have to do a transformation, but there just doesn't seem as much energy and there's retreating going on in um, the politics here. The idea of a mission that you could all work together to try and address this, and then of course, export it as well. Right, great. Well, I'm gonna ask the panelists all to um maybe pick up on those points but also to add their final thoughts i mean it's certainly the case i think that the labor party is trying to learn from the kennedy experience setting out the five missions for to galvanize uh, uk economic activity It'd be interesting to know whether the panelists think there's a realistic prospect of coming behind uh, some of these great themes including climate change and so forth um to really take us forward or whether that's a you know too ambitious for where we are at the moment. Anyway, if I could start with you, Martin, and uh, and then we'll work our way across the panel uh, and wind up as well. Thank you. So on the climate issue, uh, I've got some good news and some bad news, as it were. There are two pretty important countries which right now are seeing this as um, the basis of dynamism for their economy, a focus for pretty massive public and private investment, private investment stimulated public by public policy in order to get ahead of each other. And those countries are the US and China. I've just been to China and I've been struck by the scale of what they're doing. And it's all, it's deliberate. It's very, very conscious. Um, I won't go into, your EU isn't doing nothing here, but it has more problems for obvious reasons. There are two difficulties uh, with this, which relates to Neil's question. Um, so that is happening. And it is part of why we are actually transforming the technological possibilities, the resources going into this. Um, China, first of all, now the US. But first, it doesn't solve the global problem, because it's a global problem. It, it won't even solve the problems in those countries. and. What we're talking about is national competition uh, 
leading to something global and we're really bad at that. So it's that interface between the national competition pursuing these industrial policies <coughs> into a, resolving the global problem, the global challenge. I don't know how that works. On finance and disintermediation, probably it's my job as a journalist at the Financial Times, but I remain tend to be of the view that, yeah, probably unfair, 80% of any talk of complete financial transformation is hype. And it's very difficult to know what the real 20% is. So you may be right, and we're going to have a completely different financial sector. And there are obviously some areas, because of technology, AI, and so forth, which will be transformed. But there are certain things finance will always need. Um, among them, trust, right? And I still feel that there are possibilities rooted in British traditions mm -hmm. and capacities which are going to prove quite valuable in that regard. And I've written this before. I'm absolutely, you didn't mention it, absolutely certain is that future historians will view Bitcoin and all the rest of it as financial, from a financial point of view, as completely, utterly, and totally irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Didn't you mention it? Um, uh, but we are clearly, final point, of course, have to embrace the new technologies and the opportunities they will create, and they are clearly going to be very significant. Thank you, Martin. James? Just very briefly on this point about moments of crisis uh, and fear and whether climate change can sort of create that sense of mission. Um, I think possibly, um, entirely possibly. The only thing I'd say is it, it, it could be interpreted as a fairly pessimistic point that we need these awful crises to kind of shock us into um, to, to doing something. Uh, but I think there's an optimistic case. I mean, it, just in the last 15 years, if you think about the moments of crises we've had, we've had the we've had 2007, 2008, uh, we've had Brexit, which was a crisis in some way, a constitutional revolution in others. Um, and we've had the pandemic. And these offered huge opportunities to do something fundamental with what the state is meant to do, um, perhaps with the balance between the young and the old, um, potentially between pensioners and, and working age people. And these are sort of moments where the wheel of history failed to, to, to turn, in my view. Um, so the opportunities are there um, for quite serious change. Um, it's just we need the leaders. Um, uh, in positions of authority with a plan to, to do something in those moments of crisis. Thank you. And, and final word from Roger. Yes, I'll just confine myself to the interesting question uh, posed about London's position in regard to financial services. I must say I'm much more optimistic than the questioner. It seems to me that this is one of the few areas of the British economy where we are very dynamic, actually. Uh, and we've got quite strong positions in uh, fintech, in the burgeoning field even of green finance. Um, twice in my a recent career, there have been quite serious prognostications about the city's uh, uh, imminent implosion. First of all, when we failed to join the euro, that was supposedly going to cause you know, the city to contract. In fact, exactly the opposite happened. Uh, and then secondly, with Brexit. Now, we've lost <coughs> some business. There's no doubt about it. We've lost some business uh, as a result of Brexit. But frankly, really very little compared to the fears that were expressed. I think that the comparative advantage of the city is absolutely enormous. And it isn't just in finance, it's in business services. And there are very few cities in the world that can match it, frankly. And in Europe, there are none. Although we've lost business to a series of places, including Amsterdam, Dublin, Paris, and Frankfurt, that very diversity is one of London's strengths. Uh, uh, strength as uh, business goes in bits and pieces to these places, you avoid the coalescence of a really major financial and business services centre, which is what London is, and I'm pretty confident it's going to remain so. Great. Well, thank you very much for coming to Policy Exchange today. Thank you very much, those who made it in person, and all of you who joined us online today. And most importantly of all, thank you to our wonderful panellists today for a thoroughly stimulating uh, debate and a very important project too. Thank you.